Emergency doctors are warning the surge in Melbourne's coronavirus infections will put even more strain on a hospital system that is already stretched to the limit. There are 398 people hospitalised with COVID-19 in Victoria right now, but with a 50% increase in cases yesterday, those numbers are expected to rise sharply. Dr Stephen Parnas works across three Melbourne emergency rooms. Dr Stephen Parnas, welcome to Breakfast. Thanks very much, Hamish. Uh, how did you react? How did you feel uh, when you heard those and saw those numbers? Uh, I was startled, actually. Um, uh, didn't think that the trajectory would be as steep as that. Uh, my training reminds me that a one-off figure uh, may be an aberration, but uh, it still um, put the fear of God into everyone I was working with, and um, uh, it makes life uh, uh, pretty difficult uh, anticipating what could be ahead of us. Yeah, you, uh, as a profession, must have some concept of what that translates to physically in the wards in the days and weeks ahead, what does it mean? Yeah. Oh, it means that uh, the nature of the work that we're doing is uh, going to change into ways that we really uh, have trouble imagining, I think. We can do all the planning that we uh, can, and we've all got a bit of expertise in that, but uh, the fact is that we know that with the waves of patients that those sorts of numbers mean that we are going to have to do things and treat pa patients in ways that uh, we haven't before and do it in uh, places that we haven't done before before in hospitals uh, and the worst case scenario is having outcomes that uh, we would never have otherwise imagined. What do you mean in different ways in different places? What does that look like? Yeah, that looks like uh, treating patients uh, even outside of the hospital where, where uh, possible, if the weather allows in outdoor areas, uh, to stop them congregating. Uh, and, like in, and a lot in of that car parks? Well, outside the front of, let's say, an emergency department. Um, uh, the reason I say that is because, you know, we've got buildings that uh, very rarely have negative pressure areas. Uh, we've got an airborne virus and we've got confined spaces and we've got crowds of patients. That was something we all, I suppose, had to deal with uh, as an undesirable fact of emergency medicine um, uh, prior to the pandemic. But now that we've got a highly infectious, dangerous airborne virus, uh, what it does is it means that everything gets it's difficult, not just things like PPE, but the fact is that when you have positive cases, uh, all of the adjacent patients around them become tier one contacts. And so uh, uh, even if they are well enough to leave hospital, uh, they have to isolate for two weeks. I, I know you're constantly in communication with people across the sector in Melbourne and Victoria. Could you give us a sense of the, the level of trepidation right now? Yeah, I've never seen it like this. Uh, as one of my colleagues put it yesterday, people who are usually solid as a rock are starting to get wobbly. Um, and uh, that that's obviously concerning. But uh, I think we are all having our up and down moments. There are times when we feel strong enough and energetic enough to be able to handle whatever comes our way. Uh, and other times uh, we are genuinely fearful about what might happen or for that matter, our ability to be equal to this task. Because the, the, the uh, uh, novelty of the decisions that we have to make are huge. And I'm not just talking about things like a critically ill COVID patient, but uh, decisions like a homeless or mentally ill COVID positive patient. What do we do with them? How do we look after them when the resources either haven't been um, able to be mobilised uh, or the resources that are there are overwhelmed? And so it seems like a series of uh, new decisions every uh, 15 minutes in what we do. No wonder we walk out of the place tired. The Burnett Institute modelling uh, suggested that there'd be a peak of around 2,000 cases a day in late October. That was at the top end of what they considered. And then cases would surge again as restrictions lift after that. The hospitalisations they were looking at were modelled to peak in early November, uh, then peak again in January after restrictions lift. Speaking to the Burnett Institute this morning, they are saying to us that they believe not only could the peak come sooner, but it may move past the top end of where their modelling was. Can the state's health system cope with that? Oh, if it gets to the upper end of their modelling, then we will have areas 
which are overwhelmed. We are seeing examples of that already. Um, the Northern Hospital uh, on the northern fringe of Melbourne uh, has certainly been operating at uh, close to or above capacity for a long, long time. But in the last few days, it has gotten to the point where the the seasoned colleagues that I have out there are saying this is beyond a joke. Uh, how do we get through this? Um, patients are being shipped out. So uh, I hope we get through it. The ranges that the Burnett are talking about uh, are certainly, uh, I think, going to be surpassed. That's that's the impression that I get um, uh, uh, in those brief periods where I can have a look at that modelling because we're all trying to face up to the patient uh, that's coming through the door next. What's your message to anyone that is holding out that hasn't found the time, the opportunity to get vaccinated yet? Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, the message is becoming blunter, Hamish. Um, yeah, there are no more excuses. Uh, you've got access to a vaccine, whether it's via a vaccination centre, your GP or a pharmacist. Um, if you're finding reasons to delay, uh, you might be sitting in front of me in an emergency department suffering the symptoms of COVID uh, and asking for the vaccine then, and I'll tell you it's too late. Uh, so uh, the point about this is not just yourself, but the people around you. Um, encourage, cajole, beg them to get vaccinated as quickly as you possibly can, because really that's the only protection you've got uh, beyond keeping some level of physical distancing. And that's getting harder now that we've got uh, well over 10,000 active cases in our community. Uh, I'll read you a message we've received on the text line from one listener in Melbourne this morning. Uh, the text says, ask yourself, do lockdowns work? How about daily stats include number of recoveries? We are broken here. Broken, exclamation mark. What do you say to, I mean, there must be many people that, that feel similarly, uh, people in Melbourne that are just over these lockdowns? Yeah, uh, there's no easy solution to these things, Hamish. Uh, lockdown is hard. I've lived through it for the last year and a half. We all have. Um, the uh, alternative is uh, even less savoury, and that is large numbers of people uh, dying unnecessarily. Uh, I, I know I sound like a broken record with this, but uh, the fact is that I see that. What I'm trying to do is remind people that these things happen, and they often happen behind closed doors. But we're often seeing examples of uh, people who have lost loved ones. They lost them last year. Uh, and in last year's second wave in Melbourne, we were losing the elderly and the frail principally. This year, the victims uh, are much more likely to be younger, to be uh, fully active, uh, and in some cases, uh, to be in the prime of their lives. And uh, that's not something that anyone wants. Uh, so the point I'm making is, sacrifice is necessary if we are to try and stop something that has never been seen in our lifetime, and that is an overwhelmed health system and people dying uh, where we thought we could otherwise save them. Many of us, most of us, will not be inside one of these ICUs uh, filled with COVID, with patients with COVID. Can you take us there for a moment? Because people are there for long periods of time. Some people are dying alone, not with their family. Could you take us there? Yeah. Um, so let's talk about something that I talk about on a daily basis, and that is the patient journey. They come through the emergency department door, whether it's walking through or uh, on an ambulance trolley. We give them the care that they need. That's diagnostic uh, and, if needed, therapeutic. So anything like oxygen uh, through a mask all the way through to a recess bay where a tube may need to be put down their throat and they drift off to sleep under anaesthetic and on a machine. And for how long, we don't know, and some of them will never come off that machine. When they're upstairs in intensive care, there are beeps of machines everywhere because every single intubated patient is attached to a large number of these. They're supporting failing organ systems. And yes, as you say, there are no visitors. Uh, if the patient is awake, then using the phone to 
uh, and some FaceTime to see their loved ones might be possible. But if they're asleep, it's about messages to family, telling them how they're going and putting into plain English how seriously ill they are. Uh, If end of life is a serious prospect, then uh, we're going to do whatever we can to try and help to get some of their loved ones to see that patient. But at the moment, it might be, uh, even that might be impossible. When you have someone die, it casts a pall over uh, the entire uh, part of the hospital. Uh, And the hardest aspect is when you think that they are preventable deaths. And at the moment, if it's COVID, then uh, they are preventable with two vaccinations almost all the time. And I haven't even touched on all of the non-COVID patients who continue to need care for things like heart attacks and strokes and pneumonias and cancers. And their care is compromised because of a hospital that has uh, so many of its resources dedicated to treating the pandemic. Dr. Stephen Parnas, uh, thank you for your work and all of your team's work. Uh, We wish you all the best in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks very much, Hamish. That's Dr. Stephen Parnas, who works across three Melbourne emergency rooms. He's a former National Vice President of the AMA.